Hello, I'm No Fountain, the No Fountain, and you are listening, that is you, are listening to the Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who and the audio medium. My name's Dwayne. And my name's Philip. G'day, Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. And g'day to our special friend as well. G'day, Alicia. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so you're one of our Commonwealth neighbours coming to us all the way from Canada. How's things over there where you are? Well, I'm just outside rainy Vancouver and uh, things are fine, if a little grey. Very good. Now, I first heard you joining one of our fellow Aussie podcasters, Rob Irwin, on Primary Sources, one of the Doctor Who shows, offshoot shows. How did you meet up with Rob? You've been listening to the Doctor Who show for a while. I had been listening to the Doctor Who show for a bit. I got into it when I started watching the classic series, which was over the pandemic. And I had been making a series of vlogs in September for a project to do called Vlog Every Day in September. I mentioned the Doctor Who show and an episode that they had done um, swapping doctors and putting them in different stories. I thought it was a really neat idea. Um, I tweeted about it tagged the Doctor Who show, and Rob and I started chatting on Twitter a lot more, which is how I eventually ended up on Primary Sources. So how did you become a Doctor Who fan originally? So the original way I became a Doctor Who fan was that I was a teenager um, when the reboot of the show happened, and I didn't start watching until probably Matt was the current Doctor at the time I started watching when I was about 15 or 16. And so I went back to the start of the 2005 series, and I watched all the way up till about Day of the Doctor, about the 50th anniversary special, uh, and then stopped watching the show on TV. I'd gotten older and gone off to university and all that. But I'd always been curious about the classic series. And when the pandemic hit, I suddenly had a lot of time. And I was curious about watching the classics. And I also followed a couple of people on Twitter who were still interested in Doctor Who. And one of the things I learned was that there was this whole series of audio stories as well. So I started listening to the Big Finish stories the same time that I started watching classic episodes because Big Finish was doing free lock downloads. And so there was some stuff to listen and try out. And I love audio drama. And I think that it was a combination of the audio drama and the classic episodes that made me really fall head over heels for the show. So what is it about audio drama that you love? Is it something that... I mean, it's very big in the UK, but is it something that's big in Canada? Because it's not so big here in Australia. No, I wouldn't say that audio drama is huge in Canada, but because it's big in the UK and I'm a fan of UK authors like Neil Gaiman, I had heard different radio productions that had been on BBC Four. So they had done, like Dirk Max had done adaptations of some of Neil's stories. And I went, this is really cool. And I loved podcasts and I started listening to audio drama podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale or The Bright Sessions or Wolf 359. And yeah, I developed that interest when I was probably in about in university and it's just carried on since then. I love the intimacy of it and the imagination of it and uh, just being a creative way to tell stories. I noticed too that uh, on your website, the digitaldiarist.ca, uh, You've got a list of some of your favourite audio dramas too, and one of them was uh, the old radio version of Star Wars, which is we've we've had that recommended to us to review here on on Sirens of Audio, and I've uh, acquired it, um, but I haven't had a chance to listen to it as yet. So that uh, you're a big fan of this series. I am. My dad introduced me to Star Wars when I was a kid. So I've been a Star Wars fan my whole life. And when I got into radio drama, because I love radio and I love NPR, I learned that there was this series of 
Star Wars adaptations that NPR had produced. So I tracked them down and I listened to the first one. And one of the things that I love about the first one is that the story actually picks up before the movie starts and you get a lot more character scenes. Like you get scenes of Leia on Alderaan talking to her father. You get more setup of how she's involved with the Rebels. And I've been thinking about that series a lot more now that the new Obi-Wan Kenobi series is out and people are talking about how cool it is to see young Leia. I was like, you should listen to this radio drama. You get teen Leia at the dinner table trying to make conversation with someone that she's maybe politically opposed to. There's lots of great stuff in there. Yeah, seeing seeing your uh, love of it on your website's kind of inspired me to get listening to it too. But uh, Big Finish keep releasing new stuff and it's very hard to keep up, isn't it, Phil? Oh, it's agony to try and keep up. <laughs> All right. Um, so coming into Big Finish, what are the, as a as a new a new fan, what does that look like to you? Because Big Finish had been going, by the time lockdown started, they've been going 20 years in 2019. So what did it look like when you went to bigfinish.com and you saw all this stuff? Was it overwhelming at all? Or are you able to uh, pick and choose? Are you, are you able to cope with that? Because a lot of us fans, we're completists. We have to have everything if we start. <laughs> but but we start but we started twenty years ago, so it's much easier. To, it's it's okay for us, yeah. It's still not easy. I'm but just still... I'm just talking about new a new fan though. What's Indeed. that like? For What's you? it like? Yeah, I can absolutely see why it would feel overwhelming. Um, the strategy for me was I went. I'm interested in this, and I noticed that they had a few free things. So I went, I'll start with the free stuff and see what I like and go from there. Um, and then from then on, what was cheapest? And the cheapest stuff is the classics of the monthly range, all those sort of zero to 50, zero to 100 monthly episodes. And that was like, okay, I think that I can basically do that. I can follow the story of the monthly range. They're like $3 downloads. And that's basically where I started as I went back to the beginning. And I was like, where should I start? Um, I don't think I started with Sirens of Time. I think what I did is I picked um, a couple characters. I sort of looked up what's the story of the monthly range and I went, oh, okay. So the sixth doctor has this companion, Evelyn. That sounds good. And the fifth doctor had um, Perry and Aramem. And so I started with the, with the beginning of both those series, the Marian Conspiracy and Eye of the Scorpion. And I sort of went from there. Well, they are brilliant places to start. So well done. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've chosen for us to have a, a bit of a chat about a couple of your favourites, and you've picked single episode stories. So we're going to look at one called Urgent Calls, which is a six doctor story, which was uh, a, an extra story when there was Big Finish was starting to experiment with three part stories. And then Circular Time, you've picked one of the stories off that set, which is a fifth doctor and Nyssa quadrilogy of stories. And uh, yeah, it's going to be good to talk about. But before we do that, do you know what I see, Philip? No, what do you see, Drain? I see a rabbit hole. Let's go. Me, me. <laughs> well, thanks for jumping in with us, Alicia. I appreciate that. I'm not going to hit you with the rabbit hole topic. I'm going to hit Philip with this one. Because we're talking about single episode stories today. Is there a perfect length? For Doctor Who on audio, or is there a length that we should a avoid? Do you think? That's a good question. Um, I think you know that at the moment, my preference for a, a length episode is about fifty-five minutes. Um, I'm finding those single episodes, well, forty-five to fifty-five. I'm actually finding those single episodes in the box sets, uh, the perfect length. The, the latest box sets that come out, the began, you know, the stranded, or actually, the, the ones that really got me first was Doom Coalition. I thought each of those stories was just the perfect length. And occasionally you'd have a cliffhanger and do a double. But I actually think storytelling in that sort of, yeah, we say our format, but with commercials it comes down. Not that Big Finish has commercials. But that sort of format, I think, is, is, is the perfect storytelling for pace. But that being said, I mean, it's been interesting going back and hearing some of the, the four-parters stories that we've been, we've been diving back into. Um, and, of course, the seven-part episode we just did with the third Doctor, the last third Doctor box set, which was seven episodes, that actually, the way that was built, but it was it was very specifically... It felt like two, didn't it? It did. But it was very <laughs> carefully crafted. And so I think when Nick Briggs wrote that, I mean, you know, he, he knew what he's, he was doing. I think often with the monthly range of the four-part episodes, that was just what they did. 
and people came with a story idea and they made it somehow fits and that you know and often with the tv series that was the same too episode three tended to often just be stretched out not much happening uh and, and for, on the tv show it was partly budget in terms of you know the, the longer sh- the episode the shows were the cheaper they could make them and so that's why so many six parts got made early on because it's a cheaper way of doing the show but for audio I, you know, I actually think what Nick Briggs did when he came in and started doing three-part stories was a good idea. But I think actually making sure the show fits the story is what matters. So a seven-part story, if it's designed as a seven-part story, it works well. And our episode works well if it's a, that's what it's designed for, or four-parter. But I think sometimes having the format first and making people write to the format is where stories can suffer. You know, the, the thing I'm saying, you know, we just mentioned Obi-Wan and you know, The Mandalorian. The bizarre thing about watching those those shows on on streaming services was the episode was as long as it needed to be, and so The Mandalorian had some twenty five minute, thirty minute shows and some fifty five minute shows, because they they let the they let the story be the length it needed to be to tell the story, whereas you know a lot of television and even audio has been no no this is what we have to fill, and so we are going to force the story and even though it may not naturally fill that space, we're either going to cut it down and cut out bits that matter or we're going to pad out bits that don't matter to make it fit so yeah f- finding the right length is what i think we need to do alicia what's your thoughts on that do you have a preference of length of story uh when it comes to audio i mean the star wars ones that we were talking about that that retells the star wars story over about six hours doesn't it so uh, that's a, a very long uh story in comparison to the to the movie but uh do you have a preference I think Philip's absolutely right in that the story should fit the length of the audio. And that's been one interesting thing as I revisit um, the classic series, as I listen to more big finish stories. I actually have enjoyed Doctor Who stories of all kinds of lengths, and I enjoy audio dramas of all lengths. Um, but the most important thing is that it fits the story it's trying to tell. I think ideally for me, I love an audio drama that takes place over about two or two and a half hours. Um, I find that's a nice uh, sort of a filmic length of time to get into a story, which I really enjoy. But I've also, you know, we're talking about one part of today. I've listened to half hour stories that I have just adored. I've listened to four parters, six parters that I really like. So it all comes down to the story, really. I'm not finicky about length as long as the author understands how to tell a story in the length of time that they've got. Yeah, I mean the, the the trouble is, as I say, the trouble is though, you know, with big finish, when people buy a CD, they expect the CD to be filled, and so I think you know, whereas I guess when you're paying for a streaming service, a monthly fee, you don't care if the episodes vary in length, but you know, if you're buying a box set, then you expect a certain amount of audio to be on there, and you know, people can very easily feel shortchanged, so it, it does put pressure on the marketing side of a company. I think that has happened with Big Finish, uh, particularly around the the late Gary Russell, early Nick Briggs period, where they were experimenting a lot with different lengths. And there were some stories that seemed a little too short. Like we, we recently looked at Scaredy Cat, which was a very short story uh, set over four, like it could have fit onto a single CD, but they split it over two. The, when, we, when we talk about stories that are, that, uh, and how they relate to length, the story that keeps coming to my mind is one called The Last. Do you remember that one? Part of the Divergent Universe uh, arc with the yeah. Eighth Doctor and very Charlie. Depressing, very depressing episode. <laughs> oh, and it just dragged on and on and on. And it was like, okay, we've got uh, 160 minutes to fill here. Let's fill every single second of it. And it was too much. So there is a there is a time when I think the audio drama should be stripped back a little bit and cut. And they shouldn't worry about fitting it onto the CD, but sometimes uh, they they could be a little bit short. I mean, we were talking with Rob Shearman recently about Skirtso, and how when that came back, uh, the initial edits were about fifteen minutes per episode, and that was stretched out a lot with with sound design. So the editors and sound designers can have a lot to do with that, the quality of it as well. So, yeah, very very interesting. I'm one that uh, I tend to not really care what uh, the length of the story is, as long as the story is good, I'm happy. And I love the half-hour episodes because uh, they're extremely tight. They've got to cram a decent amount of story into a short time. So I think a lot of effort is made. And I think some authors even, you know, find the one episodes 
a little bit harder to fill because they've got to they've got to jam pack that in there and make it as tight as possible. So um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I'm I'm happy with I'm happy with anything, and I like the four parters. I'm, I'm with Alicia on uh, liking the two two and a half hours. I miss the monthlies. I miss the monthly range. I know you don't, Philip, but no, no. <laughs> Hey, I'm, I'm up for good stories. I don't care what how they come to me. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let's scramble up out of the rabbit hole. And the first story we're going to talk about is Urgent Calls, which is a story that was a single part story on a Colin Baker story called ID. And let me just read the blurb from the website. Let me see if I can find it here. There's not much to read. No, there isn't. Urgent Calls. It's written by Eddie Robson. Earth, 1974, an innocent phone call. Okay, it was a wrong number, but there can't be any harm in that. Can there? Here's a clip. Hello? Hello, am I speaking to Mr Deakins? No. Is Mr Deakins there? Oh, no, I think you've got a wrong number. Oh, oh I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's quite all right. Wait a minute. I know you. I don't... Oh. Yes. Yes, we've definitely talked before. The young lady I spoke to in the telephone box a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Yes, that was me. Good heavens. Well, I'm glad to hear you're alive and well. You are well, aren't you? I gather you're alive. Oh, yes, I'm perfectly well, thanks to you. It was the strangest thing. I still can't quite believe it happened. Uh, What did happen? Uh, well, I did what you said. I, I went straight to the hospital and got a checkup. It took an age to get seen, and and all that you'd said had put me into a bit of a panic. Oh, I'm sorry, but I felt I had to get across how serious it was. Oh, oh yes, I quite understand. Anyway, um, eventually I got seen, and it was just like you said it would be. They thought it was probably something I ate, or, or, or something like that, and, and they tried to make me go home. But you didn't let them? No. <laughs> I was begging them, saying I knew it was something else, waving my hands at them and telling them to explain what was happening with my fingernails. <laughs> then I cried. Oh, that seemed to do the trick. They agreed to see me properly. And then? Well, actually, I should keep my voice down. I, I'm not supposed to talk about this bit. Where are you? At work. What do you do? I'm a telephone operator. But but I'm in my booth. Nobody will hear if I talk quietly. All right. So, Alicia, why did you choose this one? It's your, when you look at your website, you've got Big Finish Recommendations. I love that page. I've scoured it. And uh, this is top of the list. Was this the first one you heard? It was either the first or second Big Finish story I ever heard. Yeah. Um, there's this one and there was a Sylvester McCoy one called Last of the Titans, and they were both available for free on SoundCloud. But I picked Urgent Calls because it is the story that made me fall in love with the sixth doctor. Um, I loved this half hour. This is probably the big finish story I've listened to the most because it is only a half hour. And I find myself putting it on when I go for a walk around the neighborhood because it's so enjoyable. It's so tight. Um I like it because I love how the doctor comes across in it. I think that you get all of the best of Colin's doctor. You get him being a know-it-all. You get him being a little bit arrogant, but you also get his compassion and kindness and his willingness to learn from people. I love a Doctor Who story that breaks the format a little bit. And so this one is told really from Lauren's perspective. And I loved that we got to see, oh, this is what it's like to be someone in a Doctor Who adventure who's not traveling with the Doctor, who doesn't get to see the whole picture. Um, And the performance for Lauren was so endearing. I really enjoyed getting to know her character and spend time with her character. So, yeah, this is definitely a favourite for me. Philip, what were your thoughts on revisiting this? Um, it was it was charming to go back to, actually, because I, I had kind of forgotten it. And I think, un, unfortunately, often the one-part stories were easy to dismiss. Though as soon as this one started, I remembered it warmly. Um, I think it's such a clever format in terms of it's just phone calls. And, you know, wrong numbers, but somehow the wrong numbers seem to hit the same two people. So, you know, no spoilers. It's free. Go download it. Um, but just the way that the story builds. And, and I guess all good drama is about 
telling stories in the past. You know, you, you know anything on stage it tends to be characters telling stories. Because you, know, you can have some action on stage live, but a lot of the action has to be what has happened, and, and there's a lot of retelling. So this audio drama does a lot of, this is what I did, this is what I did, then this happened. And as, as the Doctor and the, the main character, Lauren, are speaking to each other, so they're recounting what part happened to them in the past. But that really drives the, the, the momentum going. And th there's a threat there, but it's not a, not a world-shattering threat. And in fact, it's hard to know how big the threat is. It, it really is a, a beautiful character piece. And, and I think Alicia summed up perfectly. I think you do see Colin's Doctor in all his facets in half an hour. Um, and you're right, the, the warmth really comes out across. And, and even the way he tells, you know, talks a bit about his companions and, and, and the people he's met, because you know, there's a comment about you know, she'd like to meet him. And, and he, does he keep up with people he's met in the past? And he sort of talks about the fact that there's just been too many people he has met. He can't keep up with them. And that's kind of how it ends, with a, a no, knowledge of he has touched her life in this special way, but that's it. But, you know, it, it was a fairly... I, I, it surprised me how quickly the end came at the end, but really worthwhile. I just want to illustrate, had you seen any Six Doctor stories on TV before this, or was this your first column? This was my very first Colin. I had never seen any other performance of his. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah, well, can I, can I say, what a wonderful introduction. Because, you know, I, I think a lot, of, a lot of fans have issues with how he appeared on television. And I, and I think well, because of the way he was introduced. He was not introduced <laughs> this way, that is for sure. No, he certainly was not introduced <laughs> in a good way. And, yeah, which is the script editor's fault and how the writers portrayed him. But what Big Finish has done with the Sixth Doctor is he's just the most wonderful Doctor, and yeah, when, yeah, the fact that you hear heard this and, and fell in love with him, I can easily understand that. So you had no issues, Alicia, with uh, the fact that you you didn't actually get his voice; you only got it as like a, the telephone sound, so an analog telephone sound. That you coped okay with that? I did not mind, and in fact, I. As Philip was saying, I really appreciate that this is a story that can only really be told as an audio story. It wouldn't work the same as a television story because it's just this series of phone calls. And I love when a story takes full advantage of this medium skirt. So it was another one where it's like that could only exist as an audio story. It wouldn't play on TV. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because being set in 1974 and being a child of the 70s and 80s, I remember those uh, switchboard rooms. I've been in many of them in my, in my childhood. So I could visualize where she was and what it looked like and what the equipment looked like. So to me, it was bringing back a lot of visual memories, which was, uh, which was very interesting. I, I'm I sure really... Tas Tasmania still has them. I think they might do, you know, <laughs> Philip Downey. <here. laughs> um, as far as uh, the performances go, yeah, it was nice to see Lauren, uh, making the doctor at times stop in his tracks and check himself uh, for being a little bit uh, not not very human in some of uh, some of the the way he was uh, treating the situation. So I thought that was nice. Um, I also i I was can I say I was a little a little bit disappointed at the not disappointed, but my heart sunk at the ending because by by the time it was only half an hour, you really got to know this character and she really. Really, you could get a sense that she was really excited about meeting the Doctor and uh, really wanted to travel, and you felt this real sense of uh, dejection at the end of it. Uh, and I thought, yeah, I can relate to that. If the Doctor rejected me that way, I'd want to, I'd, I'd want to go off with him too. So, um, so I could understand how she was feeling there. So, yeah, really, really, really nice stuff. And as with most of the most of the one parters, they are. They're most. They're pretty good. There's not many duds out there, Philip. No, as I said, this, this this it made me smile the whole way through. Yeah, absolutely. It has a bit of a bittersweet ending, and it leaves you wanting more because you're in a similar position as Lauren. I think at the end of the story, you just wanted more time with the Doctor. I'm glad you clarified that. That's the words I was looking for. Bittersweet, bittersweet, not dejected. Bittersweet. All right, so this was, of course, on the end of a story called ID. And uh, did you get a chance to revisit that, Alicia? Or 
I did. And in fact, um, it wasn't revisiting. It was visiting for the first time because I had heard Urgent Calls on its own since it was available for free on SoundCloud. And I had never heard this story before. So this was new to me. Prepare to receive priority information. Yeah, give it. Hey! Ow! Ah, oh, no! Hey! Hey! Oh, I'm stop it! Stop! This exchange cannot be interrupted. Information has not been delivered. Priority information. Priority information. How are the Scandroids killing? Is it possible that they're electrocuting people? Well, of course it's possible. They don't run on magic. But they'd have to be substantially modified. You didn't program them to do this, did you? To protect your precious data? Priority information. You're not in control here, are you, Marriott? The Scandroids are doing exactly as instructed. Aside from the part where they kill people. Priority information. Uh, I thought the Scandroids must have been reprogrammed, but no! They're just trying to deliver the data as instructed. But the data itself is the killer. How can data kill you? Well, if I'm right, anybody who knows that will be dead. Prepare to receive priority information. My initial impression of ID, I think, was that it just, it had a pretty good pace to it, but it wasn't delivering anything new. It didn't blow my socks off the way that Urgent Calls did. Um, I thought that the concept was pretty interesting. I'm interested in stories about identity. um, And I love throwing any kind of moral dilemma at the sixth doctor, because he does have his penchant for uh, telling to giving speeches and telling people exactly what he thinks of their morals. And that's always a good time. But it, it does start to feel like it takes an interesting and strange turn in the last of the three parts. Yeah, it, it had a tendency to lose me a little bit towards the end, uh, which is okay. This is Eddie Robson. So he's written lots and lots for particularly the eighth doctor, but lots across the range. And you get a sense of Eddie Robson's writing. He's a very quirky writer. He's got a quirky sense of humor that he throws in there but also throws in the hard science fiction ideas at the same time. So he's pretty unique uh, as a writer for Big Finish. What do you think of the Sixth Doctor on his own, companionless? They were doing lots of companionless stories at this time. What are your thoughts on uh, the Doctor being without a sidekick, Alicia? You know, I think that some Doctors work really well on their own and some Doctors I struggle with, but the Sixth Doctor is one that I, I like without companion. I think that he does well. He has such a huge personality that I think that you can put him anywhere and he will bounce off the people around him. Um, Appreciated that in this story. And it's also always interesting when you have the doctor companionless and you don't have to worry about what to do with a companion. Um, You don't necessarily have to worry about, do they split up? Do they stay together? You get a chance for the doctor to interact with the other characters in the piece. And um, in this piece, I mean, he gets he gets kidnapped and he gets pulled into this sort of quest to find a missing person. And there's lots there's lots for him to do, which I appreciated. Cool. Do you have any memories of ID, Philip? I know I listened to it, but I must admit, no, I. It was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. Is this is sort of that period where I just haven't listened to much? So I think the first, you know, the whole Gary Russell era, which I guess, I don't know what the number, up, up to 80 or something, is it? Um, th- those are ones I've listened to over and over again. This is sort of when, you know, just after Gary's gone. And I think probably about 90 to about 200. I just didn't really listen to them over and over again. So it's been nice starting to dip back into them and, you know, having some time to go back and start listening to them. Um, yeah, into, into the question about the Doctor Companions, I must admit, I... I'm often more fond of the companion than I am of the Doctor. And so I love having the companions around. And, I mean, I don't think any Doctor's had more companions than Colin now, which is, you know, interesting because the, the TV was really only Perry. and they sort of well, He's just Bonnie. got another new one, hasn't he? And they, yeah. yeah, and they just threw Bonnie at the end. Whereas Colin, they, you know, he, they keep matching up with different sorts of people and they all work so well, no matter who he's with, because he's just such a great actor. Uh, so yeah, so I, I like him with companions, but he sort of always gets a de facto companion along the way somehow. But I, I think it's often hard for the writer to come up with those sort of de facto companions. I don't know whether it's uh, for budget reasons they don't 
they do so many Doctor Alone stories with it's just availability of the actors. Um, I have often wonder why they do what they do. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I do. I mean, as I said, I do remember the, the robots in this, but I really can't. I'm sure if I start to listen to it again, it'll all come back. But um, yeah. no, it's gone. What about you, Dwayne? Something that I sort of uh, had a bit of serendipity with was I was I was doing housework when uh, I was listening, as I often do with my audio drama listening. But I was I had I was probably washing up, so I had my hands wet or dirty or something. So I left it running at the end of. Uh, uh, urgent calls it was and at the end of this uh some early extras the extras had a slightly different format back in in those days and there is a phenomenal interview with one of the guest cast uh giles uh, brandreth one of these real uh old theater actors who uh sort of knows everybody and is very uh, extravagant in his speech and he was telling stories about meeting william hartnell and Patrick Troughton and Tom Baker and all these different encounters that he had with various doctors. And um, his stories were just phenomenal to listen to. If you, if, if, the, if you get any release just for the extras, get this one. It's, it's great. You're nodding there, Alicia. You thought the same? If one of you didn't bring it up, I was going to have to, because I loved that interview with Giles. And you mentioned that he was someone he had met, I think every actor who had played the doctor up to a certain point and was telling stories about a few of them. It's a fantastic interview. And I also, I really loved his voice and his performance as Dr. Marriott was one of the standouts of the story for me. It's very unique, very, very unique voice. So um, yeah, Philip, I'd recommend you have a listen to that extras, those extras. Well, I had the extras start to play, but because I hadn't listened to the first story, I stopped them. Right. So anyhow, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to the rest of the CD and, um, then I'll listen to the extras. I, I don't think I can manage to listen to the extras if I haven't heard the story first. Yeah. It's, yeah. My OCD coming out there. Very good. Let's move on to the next single episode that you've chosen, Alicia. And that is one of the stories from Circular Time, which I thought was very interesting um, because the stories on Circular Time are so vastly different to each other, all written by. Paul Cornell and Mike Maddox, although they listed together. I don't know if they wrote them together. I'm assuming they did. Um, but Autumn is the name of the story that you've chosen. And I don't have a blurb in front of me on the website. They don't have a blurb. Uh, they do on the app, but I don't have the app to hand. So here is a clip from Autumn. Linear time is currently impinging on the mortals of the Hampshire town of Stockbridge in the form of an end-of-season struggle to avoid relegation from the topmost local league of village cricket. They're raging against the dying of the light. They need wins, not draws. They need umpires to take the brightest possible view of those stormy skies overhead. They need to play in horizontal rain if they have to. I've seen them do just that in the last couple of weeks, and I've joined them so late this year that I may not be much help. Doctor? Oh, there you are. I've seen you in those strange leggings so often, but they're still funny. They are pads, not leggings, and they are not funny. Sorry. No, I'm mortally offended. I may not offer you a biscuit. Oh, don't look like that. There you are. How's your work going? Badly. I don't know where to start. I mean, I have started many times. It is a new venture for you, a novel. Don't get downhearted at a few false starts. Mind you, I'm not sure that our guest house sitting room is an inspirational place to embark on a literary venture. Well, it's quiet enough. Unless you think it would be better if we went somewhere else. No, 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 no. I was hoping to stay until the end of the season. Then we should. I just wish I knew what I was writing about. But I want to keep trying. Every time I think about giving up, I feel sad. Then there's obviously a story they're trying to get out, as I once said to P.G. Woodhouse. I know. I was there. Oops. If we're going to get out of this one, I'm going to have to show some serious aggression. Wish me luck. So what prompted you to choose this one, Alicia? So here's an admission I have to make. Uh, of the doctors that I'd seen on TV, the one that I found most difficult uh, to get into was Peter Davison's doctor, um, which was difficult 
for me than having to go on the Doctor Who show and say, hey, Rob, exactly. your, your beloved Davo <laughs> was, my, <laughs> was my least favorite television doctor for a while there. But yeah. to me, um, the fifth doctor is the one that the big finish audio has probably most changed my opinion of. And I, I came to absolutely love his stories. And to me, one of the big missed opportunities on television was having the fifth doctor and Nyssa travel together just as a pair. I think that if they had the opportunity to do that, they would be up there with like the third doctor and Joe or the fourth doctor and Sarah Jane as being one of the great TARDIS teams. And so the circular time box set, I really enjoyed. I liked all of the different stories, but Autumn stood out to me particularly because it is so domestic. It's a Doctor Who story that doesn't really have any sci-fi or fantasy in it. It's just about the Doctor and Nyssa spending this autumn in Stockbridge. The Doctor plays cricket. Nyssa falls in love. And you get to see who these people are when they're not out traveling the universe and saving the world. And I liked it because it was different than any Doctor Who story that I'd ever heard before. And it gave me a really great opportunity to get to know the fifth Doctor. What does he value? What does he like doing? And I think different Doctors have different priorities. Some of them are very keen to get out, explore the universe, have adventures. But the fifth Doctor enjoys so many things about the pace of human life, about those small pleasures. I mean, one of his most iconic speeches is an earth shock where he's talking about all of those small pleasures that make life worth living. And I think that this particular story in Circular Time is sort of an extrapolation of those ideas. I think I really enjoyed this because we always assume the Doctor has downtime. It's sort of, you know, we, we, we follow him on the adventures and we kind of hope that there must be downtime at other stages, otherwise how on earth would they cope? And so to have this two to three month stretch, um, which was, once again, too long for the Doctor. I mean, you know, we, one of the things we saw, you know, I think with Matt Smith in the uh, the cube one is three by three, not whatever it's called, the one with the cubes. The power of three. The power of three. Thank you. The power of three is a domestic one, but and you see, you know, Matt Smith's Doctor in a collage of activities, and it's only been half an hour, and he's already going insane. So I think that it's hard for the Doctor to stop, and even and I think that this is years before that was even conceived of uh, Matt Smith's Doctor. But here you already see Peter Davison's Doctor starting to go a bit stir-crazy and wanting to go, but realising he needs to stay for Nyssa, that she needs the downtime. And so, once again, he's doing it for her. And I, I do understand what um, Alicia's saying in terms of Peter Davison's Doctor is a bit bland in some ways on TV. Um, he's sweet and lovable, but can be a bit bland. And here, once again, I guess bland's still the wrong word, but he's just showing his concern for his companion, that she needs this time to herself to, to, to journal, to write, to express what's been going on. It's still fairly soon after Adric's death, where this is taking place. Um, and I think Alicia's dead right. I think I think the fifth Doctor and Nissa are just wonderful together, and all the big finish, most of the big finish audios, with just the two of them. Um, Peter Davidson always said that that was his companion. It should have been him and Nyssa. And the production team disagreed. They thought it was him and Tegan and and the combinations. But yeah, I think I think Peter Davison's instincts were right. I think he knew that Sarah Sutton, his performance was worth what gelled the best. And we keep seeing that all, over and over again. And, you know, before Janet Fielding agreed to come back, we were, we were very fortunate that we have all these stories with the two of them. So I think just seeing her development um, was just it was just sweet and I must admit I don't quite get the ending I, I don't understand maybe Alicia can tell me this is the girl point that I'm missing why didn't she stay she's obviously in love with this guy why didn't she stay I think because the guy's a bit of a prick that's why <laughs> <laughs> I think it was pretty clear to Nissa that um, Andrew I think is his name he liked her but that if something better came along, he probably wasn't going to be able to commit. And I think it's a big choice to say, I'm going to stay on earth in this time period to be with this person. And he didn't want to plan a future with her. He wanted to just roll with it. Uh, is that what, as, is that what he was time. saying? I, was, I thought he was saying that what you have is so amazing and wonderful. I can't ask you to stay. That I want you, I, th I thought he was saying, I want you to stay, I'd love you to stay, but I'm not going to ask you to stay because it would be unfair. And if you do stay and you hate it, it would be too hard. But you actually think it was just he couldn't commit. I can see your point. I see where you're coming from. But 
I wouldn't have stayed either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can I just say, I mean, I think, I think something, part of the reason I think this story is so good is I think it's actually something we could discuss at length in terms of just the characterization because it's, it's a beautiful character piece, isn't it? Um, yeah, you've got yeah, you've got these lovely characters. You've got a bit of emotion with the Doctor and who he's dealing with, but it's really in this a story. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I I had taken it the fact that he was in love with her. He wanted her to stay, but he couldn't ask her to give up what she had. But you've taken it a different way, which yeah, fascinating. What did you think, Drain? Who was the uh, in the right and wrong in the in the love angle? If it was me, I wouldn't have stayed. Of course, I wouldn't. More, many more adventures to be had. I loved the initial grab of this story was the doctor. Was it the doctor waxing lyrical about cricket? Was he, was it, was that the opening line? And as soon as he started speaking, it was, I was hooked uh, from that moment on and um, love the fact that he's playing lots of cricket, which is obviously his thing. Um, And you're right, Alicia, big finish has done a really good, and you, you said before, Philip, that the fifth doctor, could be bland on TV, but I don't know if it was him that was bland or whether it was the stories that were bland. I think that's more of what it was. I think they were just bland stories. And because we've seen on many, many occasions on Big Finish that these stories can elevate anything that these actors have ever done on television or these characters have done on television. And uh, this is certainly the case. Sometimes, you know, I, you know, I'm a bit of a, bit of a soppy guy. I, have, I, sh- I shed a tear occasionally when I'm listening to these things. And I love Nissa's emotion here. Uh, I was very invested in that, uh, particularly she's writing about her loss uh, of Traken, putting that into a story. And uh, uh, just just her feelings about that were, I, I really uh, resonated with that. It was, it was really nice. It was a bit melancholy, of course, but I like that kind of thing. I like melancholy. It's good. You can certainly feel Paul Cornell author the story. I think Paul Cornell is such an emotional writer in everything That's he does. That's right. He had and me you... bawling at Father's Day as well. Yeah. So and, same, um, same kind to, of thing. And the and the uh, double the human nature and thing, the human nature as well. Um, yeah, Another he, one. He, he has an amazing. I just don't ability. stop crying. <laughs> <laughs> he has an amazing ability to, to create emotion and and at the right time. And, and this has, this had the double whammy because it, it also had the Doctor's friend dying at the same time as you had this is love story so it, it, it had a, a double bit of emotion um which was cleverly played on yeah yeah really really good stuff in this story there's a parallel that i think is really interesting because nissa is writing about her life back on chalk and as she's writing andrew is asking about her story and he says is there a villain she says oh well but there isn't really one and he says oh you can't have a story without a villain and this particular piece of the circular time box set, Autumn is a story that doesn't really have conflict in it. It doesn't have an enemy to fight. Uh, it doesn't have what we're used to in a Doctor Who story. It's sort of just an exploration um, of not a day in a life, but a couple months in the life of these characters. And the conflict comes from their relationships. And Nissa had had this life on Trocken, which is this very ideal society. Um, it's sort of held up as being very morally correct, very intelligent, um, sort of a, a, a paragon, like something to aim for. And she's now seen it all sort of come crashing down. And the doctor thinks of this space of this cricket season as being the place that he goes to escape, to relax. And all of that starts to to crumble. And I think it's that's that's the autumn of it. It's just seeing the end of the season, seeing things that seem so golden and beautiful start to to turn cold, and recognizing that it's time to move on. Oh, it's just, it, it's just hard in terms of when you know this is ultimate faith, which is on a ship of Lazar, you know, of unclean, you know, leprosy ridden people. You sort of wonder whether this would have been better for her, the ha- the happier ending, the fairy tale ending she wanted. Though, not, not not if the person she's in love with is as bad as Alicia thinks he is. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was just it was almost nice that she could have had her happy ending, and it feels like she missed out on it. I think Nissa needed to help people in order to be happy, and I think 
that the, the reason that she stays um, at the end of Terminus is like she she wants to do good. She wants to take all of that that goodness that her upbringing on Trakin gave her and to be able to pass that on to people. I don't know that Nissa would have thrived in a small town like Stockbridge, just Love living to... an ordinary life. Yeah, it could be right. <laughs> Very good. What about the rest of the story? Did you get a chance to hear the rest of it, Philip, or just the one? Uh, I did listen to Winter as well, because that, that's one that I really enjoy. It's got a, it's a very clever, out of its sort of feel um, in terms of you know dealing with the very end of the Doctor's life. Um, not Absolutely quite, brilliant idea. Yeah. So you know, how do you whole... how do we talk about it without spoiling it? I don't know. Um, this, just, what we can say is that the story is taking part during the montage of the end of the Fifth Doctor's life. So as he's having, you know, as he's regenerating on the floor, all these different characters flash up in his head, all his previous companions, um, and it's during that montage of scenes that this story takes place with Nissa back in her life, and the Doctor P. So that's that's I don't think that's a spoiler. I think that's okay. Yeah, and so it's just understanding what's going on and you know. Because the Doctor's not sure his regeneration is going to be made po- is possible because it feels like death. And Nyssa plays a role in saving the Doctor one last time in this story. It's Yeah, I, I loved it. It's a great, great story. Did you have any thoughts on that one, Alicia? Certainly, Winter is one of, one of the weirder or more surreal Doctor Who stories that I've heard. But it's it's very interesting in its concept. And I love that idea of exploring what is happening during a regeneration and maybe what's happening when a regeneration is going slightly wrong. I think that's a great place for drama. And I because I do think of Nyssa as being sort of one of the more significant companions for the fifth doctor as being they should they should have traveled together and they do in big finish. I love that she gets to play this really important role in helping him to this next stage of life because she was she was there at the fourth doctor's regeneration and it feels um, like a really beautiful bookend that she gets to be there for him during this. Very circular time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> what did you think, Dwayne? Oh, I loved it. Loved this one. Yeah. Uh, this, like I said, there's not much you can say about it without starting to spoil it, which already did, Philip. So there you go. Oh, I've talked about this context, not what actually happens, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really, really very, very interesting. I love these uh, I love these interesting concepts that they can squeeze. Some of these authors are amazing when they come up with these ideas, where to, where to inject these stories. It just uh, blows, blows me away. Um, so what was the first? So if that was autumn, so spring would have been the first one. Set on the weird bird planet. Now, that was the weirdest one for me, Alicia. Yeah, certainly that one um, is is weird in terms of it being a, a science fiction alien planet. Um, one of the things I find very interesting about Spring is how much it calls back to history of the show. It talks about the Doctor being a Prydonian. He's on this mission from the Time Lords and they're, you know, going to this planet to meet another Time Lord. Um, we get a little bit more about the fact that Trocken's recently been destroyed. And so, yeah, I feel like it's it's rooted, rooted in this history, but it's also about this ethical dilemma about how societies choose to maintain order and how they punish wrongdoing in society. Um, and I think it's got a pretty interesting twist. You don't, you, you're not quite sure where it's going until the end. There's another Time Lord in there that uh, is mucking about with regeneration and I remember thinking when I heard this at the time, I, I had a specific thought that if the, this Time Lord was mucking around with regeneration, I thought, oh, maybe that could explain how the, the Eighth Doctor says he's half human on his mother's side. Maybe there's something involved. And I'm, yeah, that's the weird things us fans do, trying to fit different uh, canon into, uh, into the overall canon, if there is such a thing. Don't think there is. But No, there's not. <laughs> <laughs> the next story in the set was Summer wasn't it? Now, what a fascinating story this was. Uh, David Warner. Do you remember David Warner being in this one, Philip, playing Sir Isaac Newton? Yeah, actually, I actually realised it wasn't that long ago that I actually listened to the whole thing. Can I say, with that first story, you know what? I'm not a big fan of non-human characters 
in the stories and the whole bird thing I just didn't get. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes so, they I mean, work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they but, do, sometimes uh, they don't. But this one, don't. this one was okay. It wasn't a complete. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, I just, I just listen. Oh, the, the new Colin Baker box sets. There's a whole planet of on the, oh, it's not planets, a moon on the moon with all those sea creature thingies and you know, sort of sharks, sort of yeah, I sort of think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just, I'm just not big into these these creatures. Um, Getting oh, too David, old for that sci-fi stuff, Philip. Where is it sci-fi? Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> I've never, never been big into that. Um, yeah, David Warner. I mean, anything he's in, he's fantastic in. And um, I was, I was surprised because you know I don't look at cast lists before I start playing something. I'm listening to the voice thing. That voice sounds awfully familiar. And I'm, oh, David Warner. And I had totally forgotten that he was in this. So yeah. it was nice to have that little. Yeah, he'd flash up and a fun story as well. Yeah, I couldn't work out what it was trying to do at times. It was like trying to be funny and then it was dark and then it was sci-fi. It was um, not that it was all over the place. It all worked very well together, uh, but it injected an awful lot into that single story. It's an example of these stories that jam packs a whole lot in. Uh, what were your thoughts on that one, Alicia? Um, you know, I remember the thing that I remember is the performance from David Warner as Sir Isaac Newton. And it's only recently that I've actually listened to him as the Unbound Doctor and found a whole mm. new appreciation for David Warner. But uh, revisiting this story, the, the thing that I had forgotten was how comedic the guards are. And I think that that speaks to that tone imbalance. It's a little bit like Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame, where they take in this very dark Victor Hugo novel, and then they've added comedy sidekick gargoyles. Um, I think you have this very intense performance from David Warner as Sir Isaac Newton, and he's absolutely brilliant. He's doing Sherlock Holmes level deductions in this story. And it's incredibly entertaining to listen to, but then you do have these sort of very humorous moments with the guards that, that it's not that they don't work, but they're just very, very tonally different, um, which keeps the story interesting, I suppose. Any final thoughts on the single episode stories? I do think Alicia picked the best one for us. I have to agree. I mean, I am the one that picked it. I think Autumn is my favorite. But all in all, I appreciate, we were talking about how the what we prefer in terms of lengths for stories. And I think one of the nice things is that Big Finish has experimented with all different kinds of lengths. And that allows for all different kinds of stories. You know, you you wouldn't want to have a story like Autumn stretched out I think over four or six episodes, like the story would have to change a lot in order for it to sustain. Um, I really appreciate just getting a sense to dip in on all of these little adventures because the doctor is traveling all the time and there's so much that we don't see. And sometimes it's interesting to go, oh, okay. These are some of the, the smaller adventure adventures, the briefer periods uh, in their travels that we just get to, to sit in on for a moment. Cool. Excellent. Well, that sort of rounds off our discussion on the on the one episode stories. But when I contacted you, I asked you for a couple of other stories that you liked that you potentially would want to talk about. So I wanted to talk just about one of them that you chose, and that is Omega or Omega or Omega. Uh, we're all saying one of each today, so it doesn't matter. We know what we mean. Doctor Who, Omega. Once upon a time, there was a lonely time plumber called Palix, who worked alongside the great Omega. You may have heard of the great Omega. I was never up in the more obscure figures in Time Lord history. But how do you know this? Because I do. I'm Van der Kirian, conscience of the universe. Who are you? What are you? What have you got to do with Omega? Omega. That's right. Oh my God. Perhaps I prefer myself as a monster. Better to shape the universe than to be one of history's victims. You should be on your knees, screaming for the universe to forgive you. For all my reputation as a warlord, a tyrant, a megalomaniac, I am a fragile flower compared to you. Anyone got anything they want to ask? Oh my God. Anyone? Yes. Didn't you play the Randy Priest in Hearts in Orbit on Channel 30,008? 
You, my metal friend, are an electronic mugging machine. Would you like to consider a related title, sir? No, I think electronic mugging machine will quite suffice. I am now, as my brother Time Lords knew me before, Doctor. No monster, no tyrant, just the first and greatest scientist of our people. So Omega was written by Neb Fountain. It's interesting we finished talking about the the summer story from Circular Time because that had some comedy elements in it. Omega certainly has a lot of comedy elements in it too because of mainly the author. So what appealed to you about Omega, Alicia? Uh, If Urgent Calls was the story that made me go, I really love The Sixth Doctor, Omega might be the story that made me go, I really love The Fifth Doctor. Um, which if you know how this whole story plays out, maybe that's a little bit of an odd thing. I was, to I was say. thinking that as you said that. Uh, but yeah, I I think that I loved the humor of this piece. Certainly, I loved getting it. the fifth doctor, I think, in revisiting his television stories, is actually quippier than people remember him being. Um, you might think of him as being fairly mild mannered, but he does get a few one-liners in every now and then. Um, I also just think Omega is a great villain. I do enjoy um, Time Lords as antagonists. I think that there's a lot of history there that's fun. But this also had um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy vibes a little bit for me. Uh, It's set um, on this basically this this space shuttle that's on this tourist holiday experiencing a moment in the past and because of all of that humor it just it feels very whimsical and it's a story i've listened to many many times i have to say that for me the big standout for me and i thought it was the cliffhanger to episode two but it's actually the cliffhanger to episode three and it's one of those stories that once you've heard it for the first time you can never hear it again in the same way because it gives you that shock at the end of episode three um which would would spoil it if i if i said what it was but we all know what i'm talking about and uh yeah it that that was the most outstanding moment for me in that story that 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 shock because i wasn't expecting it I didn't expect it. Although you start to get hints of it towards the cliffhanger, re-listening to it today, you you could pick up on it a little. But um, yeah, it's like every it is very very Nev Fountain. If you listen to a lot of his other works for Big Finish and and other things, um, he's got a he's got a distinct style as well, uh, which is very comedic. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of drama in the story too, so it wasn't it wasn't slapstick or anything like that. It just had lots of comedy throughout which i think works it works in some doctor who philip yeah definitely it's interesting i mean this is Neil fountain's first writing for big finish and certainly he hits with a high and uh, it's what actually i was thinking having listened to this again i think next year for the 60th anniversary we need to do a special on the 40th trilogy because because big finish did this davros and master as a trilogy to celebrate the 40th anniversary and then we should probably do light at the end next year as well for the 50th and just look at the big finish contributions to the anniversaries what they did because it's very interesting what they've done along the way um so yeah there's never found this first script it's interesting that i had forgotten how late that twist happened in my head it was much earlier yeah, too and I, and I kept waiting right. for it, waiting for it, waiting for it and it was very very late when it happened um at least it's but the final right. episode is 42 minutes so it's a long gonna, episode. I was going to okay. I was going to ask that because the the last episode felt like there's a lot of action in it, so they, I didn't time it. Um, it's interesting that once again Peter Davison, who is very well known as a com- comedian, because I mean he'd done sitcoms. You know, he's made most famous role before Doctor Who was probably Tristan Farnham, which is hilarious. In it's a bit like John Pertwee, who was a comedian, but when he entered the entered the world of Doctor Who, went much straighter. I think Peter Davison was very similar too. You can see the glint in his eyes at times, but. Sadly, they don't really allow him to do the comedy he's quite capable of. And it's hard to know whether that's Peter Davison's choice or that was the production team at the time. But in this, you start to hear a lot of his comedic skills come out. I had forgotten how funny this was. Like, I really hadn't 
once again, I, I hadn't looked. I hadn't looked at it. I just put it on. I forgot it was by Dave Fountain. And about halfway through the first episode, I was chuckling at lines, and I went and looked and went, "Ah, oh, Dave Fountain, of course these." Because um, I had forgotten. My rem- my memory of it was that it was very serious, very dark, and it's it is dark at times, but it is very very funny. And some of the characters are just comedy characters. So you know, the the Doctor's sort of companion in this piece. It's just pure comedy. He's, he's written for comedy. He's a thespian actor, overblown, hamming it up the whole time. And, and wonderfully played. Um, I just, yeah, this, this was what I was just engaged with the whole time. Um, you know, Gary Russell was directing it, and as always, you know, very steady and, and, and you know, reliable script. Um, yeah, I think brilliantly picked and a great celebration for the 40th anniversary. I was getting hints of in the sound design of spare parts, believe it or not. And I happened to look at the production on both spare parts and this, and it's exactly the same. Every single person involved in this is the same as spare parts. So you hear the little uh, sort of sci-fi musical stings throughout this, and uh, you'll, you'll get similarities between this and spare parts. Russell Stone Stone. is the, yeah, did lots in that particular period. Uh, So yeah, great, great choice. Uh, Alicia, I don't know if you've had a chance to see our chat with um, with Nev Fountain that we had with him uh, a year back, but uh, it was good to talk to him ab- about this. And if you haven't heard uh, the Doomsday Contract, that was a lost story that was released about a year ago. Uh, brilliant, brilliant lost story as well, uh, adapted by Nev uh, from a script by John Lloyd who was a roommate of Douglas Adams. So very hitchhiker, connect, lots of hitchhiker connections there. So, Of course, you know, partner to Nicola Bryant. So ends up writing lots of stories for Nicola. Yeah. Yes, and wrote one of the great Perry stories of all time, Perry and the Piscon Paradox. Yes. Companion Chronicles, aren't they wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> very, very wonderful. So Alicia, what, 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 can I ask, what are you yet to explore in Doctor, the world of Doctor Who? What's your plans next for either Big Finish or the TV show? Uh, next for the TV show is watching some of the 60s stuff, black and white stuff. Mostly I've seen a good deal of Troughton, but um, I'm just now starting to watch some of the Hartnell stories. Um, and I love Ian and Barbara already. I think that they're wonderful. Oh, and... Bar- Barbara is just spectacular in every way. <laughs> and I know that uh, Rob and Dave on the Doctor Who show, they just released their season one uh, episode. And so I'm going to have to watch all of season one so that I can hear what they have to have to say about it. Um, and in terms of Big Finish. So what Finish, are you yet I, to see? Ooh, um, I have, I've basically seen everything in color except for Peter Davison's last story. I have not seen Caves of Androzani. Oh, that wow. sounds like time would make no sense to you then. <laughs> Well, I know I know what happens. I've been thoroughly spoiled. Um, but well, here's what happened. I didn't really like The Fifth Doctor, and I was watching the show. And then by the time I got to season, I guess it's 21, I really liked The Fifth Doctor, and then I didn't want it to be over. And everybody <laughs> says that his last story is his best story. It, so I, I, feel like I've been, best. I feel like I've been saving it. Um, so I, I pretty much, I mean, I know how it ends. I, I know what happens, but yeah, I'm doing it completely out of order. Um, so I have that story to watch and then, um, pretty much all of William Hartnell and a little bit of Trout and, you know, there's lots of missing stories in there that I'm going to have to go track down audio or telesnaps for, or read novelizations. Um, and in terms of big finish, I've started with the, monthly range and i've been just slowly working my way through the monthlies um and so i've listened to, to i think most of the first 100 monthly range stories and i've also listened to a bunch of uh, gallifrey because i got really into yeah, the gallifrey series yep so great so now um i'm just starting my journey with uh eighth doctor post charlie so eighth doctor and lucy miller stories i'm getting into that and um, been listening to some of the more recent box sets, like when Christopher Eccleston announced that he was coming back to Big Finish. I was eagerly awaiting that because he was my first doctor. 
And uh, so I've started listening to his box sets as well. So much, so much fun to have. Yes. Oh, it's, it's, there is so much now. I can't imagine what it'd be like coming in fresh to, to these. Yeah. In terms of being a completionist, it feels a little overwhelming. Oof. So I've, I've been trying, basically my strategy is to pick um, like a TARDIS team that I like and to stick with them for a while. So I, I started, I think with the eighth doctor and Charlie, I listened to, to their whole range and through the divergent universe arc and back, I listened to sixth doctor and Evelyn. I listened to fifth doctor Perry and Aramem. And so I try to, I try to stick with those. And then the other things that, that I find interesting, you know, pick up the occasional river song set, 10th doctor adventures, and anything that that looks interesting or that is recommended to me by experts such as yourselves. Normally, we do uh, uh, recommendations at the end of our episodes, but I think we've I think we've talked about it. Philip usually likes to say we've talked about enough, don't you? I Philip? think we've recommended enough. Today. We've recommended enough. So that's our recommendations for today. It'll be uh, what we've discussed. Except there was one thing I wanted to uh, recommend. I noticed on your website, Alicia, on your homepage. You've recently written a song and released a song. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I am I am actually a, a writer, and um, in a, in addition to writing stories and things, I also sometimes write songs. So I recently wrote a song called "Warning Signs," that is sort of about the apocalypse, and um, I it was I was going through a mood. And I think because I, I live in British Columbia, Canada, and we've had a lot of extreme weather over the last couple of years. We had some pretty bad floods last year and a heat wave. And I was thinking about that. And so I wrote this piece called Warning Signs. And if folks are interested, they can listen to it on the digitaldiarist.ca. Beautiful. There's a little extra recommendation for you. So I appreciate you coming on to talk to us about your Doctor Who recommendations alicia thank you very much thank you so much for having me this has been an, an amazing amount of fun yeah it'd be great oh, to have you too <laughs> welcome anytime all right that's it for today we'll catch you all next time guys this has been the sirens of audio episode 112 urgent autumn omega with our guest alicia neptune and your hosts philip edney and Dwayne bunny theme music by joe kramer Contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. Drop us a line at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or drop a comment on our socials or our YouTube channel. We'd love interacting with you. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll catch you next time.